he was apparently optimistic enough about the possibility of making change happen within the system that he kept trying it. Um, and perhaps there's a lesson there that we might uh, return to at some point. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is the 24th of January, 2013, and today I'm honored to be joined on the line by Gary Chartier, who is a professor of law and business at the uh, La Sierra University. He also is a contributor to the uh, Center for a Stateless, Stateless Society, where he's a senior fellow. He's also a contributor to Bleeding Heart Libertarians, and he has his own blog at liberallaw.blogspot.com. Uh, Gary Chartier, it's great to have you on the program today. Thank you for joining us. It's a real pleasure to be here. Well, uh, today I wanted to talk about Lysander Spooner, and as people out there may or may not know, it was just recently his 205th birthday last Saturday on uh, January 19th, which is probably not a date that most people have marked on their calendar, but I understand that uh, you might be something of an expert on the subject, not only be because of your background and your, uh, your education, but also because I understand you have a cat named after Lysander Spooner, so th- you are uniquely qualified to talk about him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but okay, let's so let's it's such a huge topic to start talking about the life of such an important thinker, but um let's start with the big question. Uh it has been 205 years since Lysander Spooner was born. Obviously, he's long dead. Why should we be remembering him at this point? What was his historical legacy? Well, I'd say that Lysander Spooner deserves continued attention because he was an incisive legal and political thinker and one of the real founders of American individualist anarchism. Uh, Spooner was a, uh, a practicing lawyer uh, who was interested also in uh, uh, kind of big picture constitutional issues that he didn't necessarily ever get to litigate. We'll perhaps talk about that a bit more later. Uh, whose increasing realization that the system established by the Constitution was fundamentally flawed led him to move from uh, a kind of radical uh, libertarianism that still took the state with a limited amount of seriousness all the way to a full-blown anarchism, which he articulated in some very passionate and, uh, and well-argued uh, polemics over the course of his career. Well, then let's, let's talk a little bit about his life. And of course, it's always a bit, uh, I always get a bit nervous when people start to read too much into someone's biography as that relates to their thinking, because sometimes I think we have a tendency to conflate the two. But certainly, Lysander Spooner did have an interesting upbringing with his father that might have contributed to some of his uh, free thinking ideas and his, uh, his libertarian spirit. Let's talk a little bit about his early life and uh, the background that he came from. Well, you know, there's a lot, obviously, to be said uh, about uh, about Spooner's biography, um, and I guess, uh, indeed, uh, with you, I don't want to I don't want to draw too much uh, uh, from what we might say about uh, about his uh, his earliest life, and there may be things you want to you want to to highlight there. The the two biographical things, I guess, I'd really want to highlight, but I'm very happy to to turn to anything that uh, that seems more important to you. Uh, first of all, something that Biographically, clearly did play a huge part in uh, in his thing. It has to have been his experience as a competitor with the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, Spooner uh, created something called the American Letter Mail Company, uh, which he demonstrated practically was capable of outperforming the Postal Service as a contributor to uh, to mail delivery in several major cities. Uh, the the ultimate result of this was that the U.S. Congress deliberately put him out of business, uh, creating uh, legislation. Uh, uh, requirement uh, that made competing with the Postal Service uh, impossible, and of course we continue to see that today, uh, the, the legacy there in the uh, Postal Service's uh, limits on, uh, on first-class mail competition. Uh, the other thing uh, in his biography, and again we can dwell on either of these in more detail, but the other thing in his biography that I'd really want to highlight would be his um, uh, involvement in the abolitionist cause, and this was not just a matter of framing constitutional arguments against uh, slavery, which he did with great passion, but he actually uh, was involved in some more radical stuff as the um, um, uh, crisis involving the uh, um, uh, prosecution of John Brown continued after Harper's Ferry. Uh, Spooner is actually involved in efforts uh, to plan for the kidnapping of the uh, governor of Virginia to uh, trade 
for the arrested John Brown. Uh, so he was he was very much an on the ground uh, uh, abolitionist activist of uh, a really radical nature, and I think that opposition to slavery was was clearly one of the things that led to his uh, his own increasing radicalization. But there may be other aspects of his biography you, you'd want to highlight. Uh, but well, well, in fact, you bring up two of the three main areas of his life and thought that I really wanted to hit on today. So why don't we start with the American Letter Mail Company and let's set the background for people about where he came up with this idea and why it, it was so important and what his success and subsequent, I suppose, failure at the hands of the state really teaches us about, about what he learned in that experience from, uh, from trying to go against the state. Well, um, so uh, Spooner uh, at this point is uh, is in the Midwest. Uh, he's uh, uh, this is um, sometime in the early 1830s. I'm not remembering the exact date, but uh, in any event, uh, he has uh, uh, been involved in uh, a fairly unsuccessful uh, land speculation effort uh, here. And uh, you know, I think he's uh, you know he's a long, young lawyer who's looking for uh, looking for ways to succeed entrepreneurially, and. Um, he's able to demonstrate, I think, re- really successfully that that service linking, I believe it's six cities, um, uh, can uh, can dramatically outperform uh, the uh, the U.S. Postal Service, and this is this is a going concern, uh, you know. I think a lot of people will be aware that it is regularly claimed uh, that a functioning postal service is just the sort of thing that we need a state to provide. I mean, it's an odd sort of notion. Uh, postal service is not, in the traditional sense, uh, economic sense, a public good. Uh, it's possible to uh, exclude non-payers and certainly to make it go as a, as a market concern. But people often think that somehow uh, we're going to lose out if we don't have a state-driven uh, postal service. And what Spooner did was to show that a uh, a clearly profitable alternative to what's often seen as a central state activity uh, could be managed uh, clearly with limited startup capital by a guy without previous experience doing this sort of thing. Uh, and obviously, this is in part a testimony uh, to his own uh, uh, intelligence and pluck, but it's also got to be a comment on uh, the, the real uh, possibility of outcompeting the state on its own territory. And if, so, of course, what was the natural reaction of that? Of course, the state moved to to shut that down and outlaw a competition to show that uh, that that in the end, I guess the the upstarts will never win. Exactly, they won't win. Not because they're better, uh, or not because they're not better, but because they uh, simply can't respond to the state's overwhelming uh, threat of force. And uh, uh, so, really, uh, really a problem. Oh, and uh, you know. This, this is typical of the, the early Spooner. That is, he's interested in taking on the state in its own, own territory. Perhaps this was the, the third thing you were thinking of, uh, having to do with bar admission. And, uh, you know, as a, uh, uh, as a young lawyer, uh, he worked to uh, make it the case that educational qualifications didn't serve as a, as a barrier to uh, his, uh, his bar admission. He studied, uh, uh, you know, in a law office and then succeeded in, uh, you know, meeting, uh, meeting bar requirements and convincing the uh, legislature uh, that indeed uh, he shouldn't be ruled out as a candidate because he hadn't met uh, really some fairly arbitrary uh, uh, licensing rules. So he had lots of experience taking on the state in ways that I think made clear to him that there was all sorts of arbitrary uh, sort of regulatory foliage that the state had uh, allowed to uh, to grow up around people's exercise of their freedom. Uh, and his initial strategies really were ones in which he tried to uh, uh, sort of work within the system. Uh, it, what's clear is that time went on. He wasn't comfortable doing that. But, uh, you know, for, for a long time, um, he was apparently optimistic enough about the possibility of making change happen within the system that he kept trying it. Um, And perhaps there's a lesson there that we might uh, return to at some point. Well, exactly right. As a matter of fact, I wasn't going to bring up the, uh, the his early bar admission but uh, fight, but that that it is actually, I think, a, a very important part of this early Spooner, as you as you put it, where he's trying to uh, to defy the system, but still to reform the system or amend the system in some way from within. But uh, I think we can see that he definitely departs that in his later years. So let's let's continue on with that journey. So after the American Letter Mail Company experience, um, he gets more deeply involved with the abolitionism and activism along those regards. Tell us. About about his uh, his anti his abolitionist uh, views. Well, 
So uh, Spooner obviously believes that slavery is a great moral wrong, but he also thinks that it's possible to argue uh, that it's a moral wrong that doesn't involve, doesn't, uh, uh, that isn't entitled to constitutional protection. So uh, it's ordinarily assumed uh, in this period, both by the friends of slavery and by its foes, that uh, in fact, uh, the Constitution is, uh, of course, as William Lloyd Garrison famously said, a compact with hell precisely because uh, it does enshrine protections for slavery and was designed to keep the Union together uh, at the expense of permitting slavery in, uh, in those uh, states that, uh, that authorized it. And so what's really interesting then about the strategy Spooner adopts is that uh, he thinks that uh, reading the Constitution in the right way can lead us to avoid uh, seeing it as uh, embracing protection for slavery. So uh, he wants to show that uh, slavery really can be seen as inconsistent with the Constitution. Uh, and so there's a sense in which he's developed uh, a kind of strategy for reading the Constitution that you might see as, uh, you know, perhaps kind of ironically, uh, given uh, uh, how his thinking develops, as sort of parallel uh, to, say, uh, Ronnie Dworkin's notion of a moral reading of the Constitution, uh, in which uh, there really is an attempt uh, not so much to ignore the surface level uh, textual meaning, but to try to integrate uh, that uh, a reading of the surface level text into a sort of deeper moral uh, picture of uh, where the Constitution might be headed. Now, I think the later Spooner, and certainly later folks uh, influenced by Spooner, would probably be inclined to say that may assume too much about uh, the, uh, quote, moral purpose of the Constitution. Maybe in reality, uh, the Constitution uh, does have uh, the uh, moral flaws that uh, later critics would see uh, built into it, and it's really not the case that uh, uh, we can find in the Constitution a, um, uh, a sacred text that uh, has only been ignored or distorted. But what's interesting, at least, is that Spooner tries to make the case that if you put all the relevant passages of the Constitution together, you get a, uh, a document that, uh, that does rule out slavery. And then, as I say, uh, not only is he arguing this on the legal front, but he's also pursuing this as, uh, as an activist as well. Well, that's right. And of course, it is uh, ironic or interesting at any rate that he is making that kind of constitutional argument about um, uh, slavery and abolition, as opposed to, of course, the later Spooner, where, who is, of course, most famous for the uh, constitution of no authority. So let, uh, let's let talk about some of that, the, the development of that uh, that thought in Spooner and, and his eventual complete anarchism, his, his turning away from the state and constitution. Let's talk about the, uh, where the, those ideas sort of fomented for him, uh, what kind of philosophical ancestors he might have had in that, and, uh, and really what the, the reception to those ideas were at the time. Well, so um, it seems as if um, the most uh, kind of natural way to read Spooner, uh, in, uh, Spooner's intellectual antecedents, is to see him as a... Um, you know, as a kind of radical Lockean, a radical descendant of uh, the uh, intellectual tradition that really is the official doctrine, let's say, uh, surrounding the American Revolution and then later the abolitionist movement. Now, I think the abolitionists are, are sincere about it. Uh, what the, quote, founders uh, really uh, think at a deep level is a more complex question, and I don't know that we can sort that out here. But at any rate, the official doctrine that gets uh, pronounced by the American founders is one that is, as I say, radically Lockean. It's rooted in uh, in John Locke's uh, conception uh, that people are self self-owners and that uh, political authority is justified, if at all, only in virtue of the consent of the governed. Um, Locke's own view, of course, uh, is more complicated here, not least because uh, he thinks that while the state, uh, in some sense, uh, requires consent to get going, uh, somehow later generations, while they may be justified in extreme cases in revolting, and this, of course, is the view that the American founders adopt, uh, state authority doesn't require a consensual grounding on an ongoing basis. Um, 
the uh, notion of self-ownership really plays a crucial role, uh, probably not so much in the thought of the founders, but in that of the abolitionists who see this picture of people as self-owners as fundamentally violated by the notion that some people claim the legal right to own other people. And so they appeal to this fundamental American tradition to uh, treat, uh, to identify slavery as something that really ought to be uh, uh, abominated and abolished. But Spooner then is, is able to extend that notion of self-ownership, to point out that if you take the abolitionist idea of self-ownership seriously uh, and you think about the conception of consent that's defended by the American founders, what you find out is that it's really an inadequate conception if it doesn't take seriously the fact that ongoing actual consent uh, is required if people aren't to be enslaved, if people aren't to be treated uh, as uh, as slaves. And so therefore, Spooner is able to develop and articulate uh, a notion of political authority in accordance with which justified political authority dep- depends not on uh, you know the majority consent of one's ancestors, but on one's own actual consent. Uh, that there are obviously moral requirements that obtain whether one consents to them or not, but political authority doesn't uh, turn out to be valid uh, on a Spoonerian view unless people actually consent to it. And uh, uh, that then provides the basis for um, uh, Spooner's uh, uh, really passionate uh, tracts uh, in, his, uh, in his later life. Not the only thing he writes about by any means, but certainly uh, probably the most enduring stuff. Well, let's talk about the immediate reception to those works, because uh, certainly uh, Spooner was not known for being particularly diplomatic about his views, and he, he certainly was known as a free thinker on, on deism and abolition and, and all of his uh, various views. Let's talk about the way his work was received during his own lifetime. Well, um, it, it may come as a surprise to some uh, viewers, come listeners, to know that his work did not convert 19th century America to anarchism. Uh, it, uh, it was not the case, uh, unfortunately, that there was a uh, wide-ranging and enthusiastic reception of his denunciation of the Constitution and uh, the American state. However, Spooner did uh, gain a very... Uh, enthusiastic and committed following in the circle of 19th century American individualist anarchists uh, around and led by Benjamin Tucker. Um, uh, Tucker provided uh, a Spooner with a platform in uh, uh, his uh, in his publication Liberty and he was very pleased to identify uh, Spooner as a tremendously important figure uh, whose death he really mourned in a you know in a very uh, warm obituary. Uh, so in that circle, uh, the circle that uh, you know that arguably began with Josiah Warren, uh, but uh, then uh, really uh, flourished uh, under Tucker's leadership, included people like William B. Green, uh, Voltaire de Clare, um, Dyer Lum, uh, those folks. Obviously, not a kind of ideologically cohesive group, but a but a kind of loose community of American radicals. Uh, I think Spooner's thought was kept alive, uh, was uh, embraced, not in its totality, of course. You know, the the standard view, I think, in the Tucker circle, for instance, was uh, an anti-intellectual property view, where Spooner held a radically pro-intellectual property view, and that set him apart, uh, certainly in that way, from those folks. But as a general rule, I think his critique of uh, the legitimacy of consent-based justifications for the state uh, was something that those folks were glad to keep alive and to continue transmitting uh, down, the, down the years. Well, then let's talk about that long-term perspective, because obviously I think it's something that, uh, that all anarchists of all stripes and persuasions these days can agree on is that Lysander Spooner is an important thinker and someone that a lot of people are still content to look back on as, as an important uh, philosopher in that regard. But of course, there are these different branches and flavors of anarchism that still war over various uh, philosophical antecedents, etc. So uh, to what extent do you think we can situate Spooner within that, that matrix, and is it even valuable to do so? Well, uh, what often happens, uh, and I think we can all be pleased by this, uh, what often happens as uh, the past recedes uh, is that ideological divisions uh, 
start to seem less pronounced and important than they did uh, when uh, a thinker like Spooner was alive and debating. So I think everybody agrees that Spooner belongs in the camp of the 19th century uh, individualist anarchists, uh, but even people who are perhaps more inclined to identify um, with the anarchist strand uh, rooted uh, more in Central and Eastern Europe that, uh, you know, roughly speaking, we can talk about as the, as the contemporary social anarchist uh, strand within the broader anarchist movement. Um, I think the, those folks are quite happy to see Spooner as, uh, uh, you know, a vibrant and important member of the American anarchist tradition. Um, Spooner's uh, IP views, as I noted, noted are uh, sort of radically um, propertarian in a way that, uh, you know, certainly other folks uh, who tend to share the, the Tucker view, and that, of course, includes a lot of contemporary ANCAPs as well as others, uh, wouldn't endorse. But Spooner's overall approach is not typically, I think, going to be dismissed by contemporary social anarchists as a kind of right-wing approach because it was clear that he was a pro-labor guy. He was somebody who was uh, very interested in helping uh, to ease the burden of uh, uh, kind of debt slavery that people experienced. He had, had a very radical view about, uh, about when uh, uh, debt contracts could be enforced and things like that. And so his impulses clearly were not pro-status quo. They weren't pro- um, kind of the, the economic elites of his time. And because of that, uh, because of his radical anti-slavery views and so forth, even though uh, obviously he's a market anarchist, uh, people in the social anarchist tradition, I think, are, are even if they disagree with him, are going to see him as somebody who's part of the broad anarchist movement. And so he, like Tucker, is somebody from that 19th century world who... Uh, despite disagreements about their positions among contemporary anarchists, is going to be uh, a source, I think, of connection between modern market anarchists and modern social anarchists. And I, I think that's all to the good. Well, one of the things that I'm hoping that this conversation that we're having right now will motivate some of the listeners to do is to actually start reading some Spooner directly instead of ta listening to people talk about him. So, so in that regards, if there are people out there who are maybe starting to dip their toes into the waters of Lake Spooner, what, uh, what works would you actually recommend for those people or what, uh, what do you think they should be concentrating on at this point? Well, so uh, one real service that uh, Randy Barnett at Georgetown has done has been to create LysanderSpooner.org, which uh, features a lot of Spooner's work. And people can go there and uh, discover uh, Spooner texts for themselves. Uh, many of those texts, of course, are going to be available elsewhere online as well. I believe uh, Liberty Fund's online library of liberty uh, features uh, some stuff. So there's a lot to, a lot to uh, dip into. Also, uh, Cobden Press... Uh, has uh, begun issuing uh, some some Spooner texts and, for instance, has recently published a collection of Spooner's work on religion, which is uh, uh, probably some of his more obscure stuff. And uh, my friend Jim Perrin, who is the uh, the editor at uh, Cobden, the director at Cobden, uh, has hunted up stuff that uh, uh, really has not been available uh, in the past and cleaned up uh, the uh, the text and the, not to say he's bothering it, but that is he's ensured that the print edition really directly matches the earlier Spooner text in a way that some online stuff does not. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Much of it's online. Um, you know, some things that uh, people might look at, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the Constitution of No Authority uh, is a uh, pretty decisive argument uh, against uh, consent-based justifications for state authority. I think that that continues to be a very live uh, text. Uh, the letter to Thomas F. Bayard uh, uh, contains, uh, again, some passionate anti-state polemic. The, his uh, letter to Grover Cleveland, uh, fairly uh, amusing, I think, if you think about the way in which Cleveland is sometimes lionized by contemporary classical liberals. Uh, Spooner uh, will have none of it and uh, really is very direct in his, uh, his condemnations there. You know, those are some of the texts that people often quote the most today, uh, and they would be well worth starting with, but I really do encourage people to poke around uh, LysanderSpooner.org and the online library Library of Liberty, where you'll find uh, the text of uh, the one complete uh, biography of Spooner that's, uh, that's available. I'm not remembering the author's name right now, but also many of Spooner's own texts, uh, all there for free. Uh, and uh, perhaps Spooner himself would be unhappy about uh, the fact that they're available uh, without copyright protection, but he'd be delighted, I'm sure, that you're, you're reading them. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Well, uh, on that note, I, I do appreciate your time today. And I should uh, mention that this was made possible through the, uh, the, uh, the Center for a Stateless Society, where I got in touch with you uh, via. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you are a senior fellow there. Perhaps we should just talk a little bit about the center and uh, the work that it does. Well, thank you very much for giving us uh, uh, the chance to talk about that. So C4SS.org is the home online of the Center for a Stateless Society, um, which is a think tank and media center devoted to developing and uh, promulgating uh, market anarchist ideas. Um, there's a, a fairly wide diversity of opinion within uh, the uh, market anarchist community, and C4SS tries to be a relatively big tent, though, as people who visited there will know. Uh, it's identified uh, specifically with the, uh, the left-wing market anarchist or left libertarian approach that I think Spooner and, uh, and Tucker certainly would have recognized uh, and embraced. Uh, C4SS uh, publishes commentaries, which are circulated uh, among uh, uh, newspapers around the uh, around the world and uh, uh, gets uh, a limited number of uh, publications in those newspapers in pretty far off places, including Bangladesh, uh, around uh, around the world on a uh, on a weekly basis. It also funds the production of research studies, particularly by Kevin Carson, uh, whose uh, ongoing and enormously productive work is something we're uh, we're very proud of. But uh, it's home to a number of other people uh, listeners might be aware of. Uh, including Roderick Long, uh, Brad Spangler, Charles Johnson, uh, Sheldon Richmond, who's our board chair, uh, Joe Stromberg, a wonderful uh, historian of uh, American radicalism. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting lots of people because the number of those associated with the center continues to grow. Um, we've got a number of other projects in play right now uh, that folks might be, of int- might be interested in. For instance, uh, Ross Kenyon and Roderick Long and I are editing a collection of classic and contemporary texts on libertarian class theory, classical liberal class theory. People often suppose that when we talk about class, uh, we've uh, fallen into some kind of Marxist swamp. But the fact is that Marx himself acknowledged that the first uh, systematic thinkers about class were actually some radical classical liberals in 19th century France, uh, Comte and Dunoyer particularly. And so we're drawing on those folks and uh, more recent uh, class thinking to point out this, uh, the existence of this alternative. Uh, we're also working on a collection called Liberal Liberation economics that will be a jointly authored, uh, uh, we hope, a fairly accessible introduction to the kind of thinking, not, not so much about politics and political theory, but specifically about economics that a number of us are involved in. Uh, plus, we all have our own individual projects that we're, uh, we're working on. So I think it's a pretty fruitful uh, collaboration, and it's an exciting group to be part of. Absolutely. And I look forward to uh, hopefully highlighting more of the center's work in the future as we go forward. But uh, on, on the note of the individual project projects, if people are interested in following your writing specifically, what's the best place for them to go for that? Well, so uh, you pointed out that uh, my blog, liberallaw.blogspot.com, is uh, one home for, for short pieces that I write, as is Bleeding Heart Libertarians. Um, Meanwhile, I've got uh, I've got books uh, that uh, are out and are in the works. The ones that might be of most interest to people uh, listening to this podcast or viewing it uh, would probably be The Conscience of an Anarchist, uh, a book that I hope Spooner would appreciate that I published uh, in 2011. And then uh, Anarchy and Legal Order, which is a more technical academic work that uh, Cambridge University Press released this November. Um, the uh, Conscience of an Anarchist is available from Cobden Press at uh, Free Minds, FR33MINDS, uh, on the web. And uh, the Cambridge University Press book can be obtained from Cambridge or from, uh, from Amazon. Uh, there's also a laissez faire book club electronic version uh, of uh, Conscience. Uh, you have to join laissez faire books, of course, to, uh, to get that, but the print version is available from Cobden. I lo- I'd love for people to buy Anarchy and Legal Order, but the hardback edition, which is the only thing that's available right now, is ridiculously expensive, and it may be that waiting for the paperback is the wise thing to do. Refreshingly honest. All right. Well, Gary Chartier, I really do appreciate your time today, and uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and insight on Lysander Spooner. It's been a pl- pr- yeah, pleasure and a privilege to be here. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com slash support.